This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? So we are with my buddy, Ryan Hanley, the gentleman that chose the exact wrong time to start a scratch agency by agency standards, but by my standards and knowing his skill set for content development and ridiculous distribution, he started it at exactly the right time because he has such a leg up on his competition that is not readily apparent right now that it's only a matter of time. So Mr. Hanley, welcome to the Power Producer, sir. Oh, it's, it's good to be here, man. I'm, uh, I'm very excited for this for a lot of reasons. Yeah, so we were talking about our good friend Mike McDonough, the work comp renegade, and his level of intensity that he brings to the workers' compensation game. <laughs> and I, you know, it's funny because Cass sort of did an end around on that whole deal, right? So that whole thing started out where it was going to be me, Todd Tams, and Mike were having dinner. And then Mike's like, well, let's, let's invite Cass, let's invite Chris Green. And the next thing you know, like we got a table for 12 at this place. And I was at the complete opposite end. So it's always funny because when Mike says something, he's like, you know, I really wish I would have gotten to spend the time talking to you in San Diego. Not that I don't like Todd, but you're all the way at the other end of the table. And I really wanted to pick your brain while you were there. And I said, well, brother, you got my number. You can call me anytime you want. He is, he, he's a crazy dude, man. Like yeah. that guy. So I found myself at that table. So I am, an agency owner in name only at this point, because I literally had founded, I'd gotten the paperwork back on the LLC about two weeks beforehand. I had zero appointments. I was working, you know, and then I show up at, uh, I'm on my way to the conference there, IOA, and Cass goes, yo, bro, I got you into the gangster table, man. I got you into the gangster table. Like, you're all set up. Like, you you just roll with me for dinner, and and I got all the killers at this one table, so... I mean, who's going to say no to that to, to that you? introduction? So, uh, so I had no idea what I was rolling into. Like, I knew a couple of the people that are going to be there. I didn't know like Chris was going to be there. I didn't know Todd was going to be there. I, uh, I just knew Cass was taking me to this dinner. And the way he made it sound was like we were all going to be. It was going to be at like some casual spot so we could like rap and talk and like move around and get to know each other. And it ends up being at like this formal ass place with this long table. Where yeah. I got you on one end and I'm super interested in what you're saying. And I got Mike is sitting right next to me and he's getting all fired up. And like he talks, he just talks hard. I don't know how else to describe it. Like it just, the words come out hard. Like he's just like, rah, 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 rah. And, and good stuff. I mean, like I'm trying to take it all in. I'm not trying to take in what you're saying. Cass is talking at me from the front. And like, then you're trying to get some of Todd and, it, it was just, you know, you know, I wonder what it looks like when Mike McDonough's wife comes home from like, if I don't, if she works and he hasn't seen her in a while, like how intense is that? Hi, honey. Welcome home. Yeah. Good to see you. You know what I mean? Just so like, intense. Really... But yeah. He did, yeah. And he, he was really throwing down, you know, it's funny, man, because we were talking about workers comp and the fact that, you know, we just spent an hour on that podcast, just laying it out. Anybody who wanted to learn, how to deal with workers comp in the middle market 
anybody who wanted to learn how to sell against a, in a PEO or employee leasing company in the middle market and unbundle their invoices so they knew where the hidden dollars were and all of that would be foolish not to listen to that. But at the very end, I told him, I said, you know, there's no magic wand. You know, we can show you a process. We can teach you what needs to happen and we can give you some technical knowledge. But at the end of the day, man, you still have to execute. Yeah. It's not, it's not like you can just walk out and, you know, all of a sudden you're going to have people running up to you wanting to buy workers comp from you. You have to execute on that stuff. And I think the average agent's too lazy to do it. I really do. I, let me tell you this for certain. You do not just go out and people come running up to you for insurance. I can tell you <laughs> firsthand that as someone who's brand new, that is not how it works. But uh, I will say that, um, so it's funny, I just I just had a conversation with Zach Gould from GNN. He and I um, talk, you know, at least once a month, we have kind of one-on-one -on -one and really just whenever, I mean, we just talk. And um, and I really respect the way that he, he views the business. And he's got, I'm not gonna blow up his announcement, but he's got an announcement coming about some of the things that he does. And, and it's, uh, it's really interesting. Like the, the, the core of our conversation was but like um, as they were coming up to the sale of GNN, like they knew, none of the rest of us knew, but as they were coming up to the sale of GNN, I think their world, they were expanding they, their world because they thought that was the next step. And, and ultimately what they've decided, and I couldn't think, I couldn't uh, respect this decision more, is they just want to sink their world back in and just go even deeper on what they built at GNN. And the reason that I bring that up in this moment is because where our conversation went was really around some of the things around automation and some of the things around, <clears throat> uh, you know, all the tools. And, and I told him, I have scaled the tools that I use in my agency down to two tools. I use QQ Catalyst and Agency Zoom. That's it. Those are the only two tools that I use. Everything else is my cell phone, my hard phone. I send out mail, regu like regular mail. I use email, like Agency Zoom does text message, but that's it. I use two tools. And, and what I'm worried about, man, to your point, is that we're so focused on automation right now because we are scared shitless to sell, to like pick up the phone and convince someone that they should choose us over someone else as an industry. We're so far. And look, I'm just getting back into it. I got my ass kicked all morning cold calling. I got absolutely effing destroyed. 0 for 15, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I stopped making calls and started doing other stuff. And 15 is not even that many. You know what I mean? Like, I'm still getting my own sh shit lined back up with getting bludgeoned. But that's what you got to do, right? Like, like eventually I'll get better. Eventually I'll start to dial in my targets. Eventually I'll start to know how to talk to them. Eventually I'll get my pitch down. And it's going to be, you know, gut punch after gut punch to get there. And, I, and, and what I see is people using – focusing on tools and spreading out wide because they don't want to get punched in the gut. It's so much easier to say, oh, I'm not really good at automation. It doesn't really work. So I'm just going to focus on that instead of, you know, I'm going to send out, you know, do, do whatever you have to do. I don't know. I think part of it too has to do with the fact that the internet has created a, um, I don't know, competitive environment, I guess, for lack of a better term for all the wrong reasons. Right. I think that, when you, I mean, we like the fact that we have online communities and we can talk to people and we can network and we can learn from them and all of that stuff. And obviously that's a, that's a thing, but then you also run into the people who see that everybody else has a VA. So they have to run out and get a VA so that they're part of the cool kids club. Yep. They, you know, automation is a buzzword, right? Like all self-service portal, all of these things, when at the end of the day, the guy that's going to go out and knock on 20 doors every day is still going to come out ahead of those guys every time, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, can you use automation to knock on those 20 doors in a more educated fashion or to at least warm up or follow up after you've done that? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, nobody's going to make a buying decision because you've got a VA. Nobody's going to make a buying decision based off of the fact that you sent them a drip email campaign. They may show interest, but they're not going to make a buying decision off of that. It's just a tool. And look, I've had to, and the reason I can say this from a position of authority at this exact moment is because in the last four months I have followed and I've, dude, you and I have had like had therapy sessions 
about this particular topic of me chasing rabbits down holes, getting lost in automation systems, getting lost in all these different places. And what I've come back to, and now that I've actually started to sell and I'm selling on a more consistent basis, what I'm really realizing is all these things are just, they're just tools and they either work or they don't work. That That's what I think that the part that people are missing is like, I'm doing direct mail. Right now, 50% of all the policies that I've sold in my agency are from direct mail. I'm doing ED, uh, EDDM, if that's if I'm saying it right. Yeah, EDDM, Every Door Direct Mail, uh, through the Postal Service, and I am selling, I, I have a positive ROI from direct mail. And I actually just signed up today, this morning, uh, and it's, it's what actually cut me off from my cold calling. I got a call in from a direct mail, woman had like four rental properties. She's like, I'm just fed up. I never hear from my agent. I saw your mailer. It looked good. I'm calling. Can you help me? Is that the one that, is that the one that we talked about? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I took some of your shit. I took some of mine and mashed it up. Uh, put a good looking dude with some kids on the front of it and out the door it went. (laughs) Yeah. It works though, man. I mean, isn't that crazy? The like direct mail is not, there's nothing more basic than that. Right. And yet it still works. Like people get pissed off because telemarketers interrupt their dinner. Guess what? They have a job for a reason. Even though the percentage is low, the volume is high and yeah. they're still going to hit it. I'm interested in how you why you got shut down today. What was the obstacles you were hitting? So, I, I you know, my my I will tell you right now, my script for my commercial cold calling, I'm a little weak. Uh, I know like my skills aren't back back up to cold calling par yet. Like I'm coming in a little I got a little I got some cracks in my game. I'm not real comfortable with how I'm coming in on my pitch. Um, I was trying something a little new today. So I actually, I'll tell you the line here. Where do I have it written down? I was going to say, if you think you're going to escape without telling us your script, you're kidding yourself. No. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you the whole script because it was all over the board. But the line that I started using that actually got me a callback, the guy was, you know, busy. We'll see if he was or not. You know what I mean? And he kind of blew me off to next week. But um I, you know, I kind of did the intro. How's it going? I'm doing the, you know, though my book has not arrived yet, or I haven't read the book yet, uh, every two minutes or whatever, extra two minutes, um, you know, from being part of Killing Commercial, I knew do a little research. So um, I knew this guy, I found him on Facebook. I knew he lived in Latham, which is where I live, even though his business was on the other side of the river. Uh, And where I'm from, the Hudson River is like, if you're on one side of the Hudson River, you don't go to the other side. And the people on the other side think the exact same thing about the other side of the river. Everyone doesn't matter. So um, so I knew even though his business was over there, I had to talk to him like somebody from this side of the river, right? And that that actually means something in, in Albany. And um, so I got in and I was like, hey, you know, I see your business on the other side of the river, but from over here, like, what does it feel like to have to drive over the river every day? Like, you got to put different clothes on. You know, I hit him with like I th- what I thought was a pretty good line. He bought that. And then I said um, my pitch into him was um, uh, we teach business owners how to uh, take control of their total cost of risk. That's the line that I gave him. And he paused for a second to kind of take that in, what that meant. He obviously never heard that terminology before. And I felt like Maybe I came at him a little technical with that line. Like it might've been a little heavy for him. Um, but he took it in, he took a second. And then he kind of said, look, man, like um, I'm not going to say that I'm interested or not interested, but you can call me back next week. Call me back on Wednesday of next week. And, you know, I'll have some time for you. So that that was my that was the last call I made before the woman called me. Um, so, you know, like I said, I, I feel a little shaky. I don't have it dialed in yet, but I'm just going to keep making phone calls until I start to figure out what works. Yeah. I think that's half the battle, man. Kyle's a master of the phones. Yeah. Well, that's why I have my notes out. Look, I, well, I don't know if people see this, but I literally have a pen and paper. Cause I know I got the guy is on the bottom of my screen here. So I'm <laughs> talking. Well, I think half the battle that, you know, you, that you nailed was, uh, you know, doing research on the front end to figure out where this guy, a, you know, where his business was, but more importantly, like where, where he was from so that you could find something to relate to him. Cause it's especially on the phone and you've got to grab their attention within the first couple of seconds or else you're getting, you're getting banged on. So, I mean, for you to be able to kind of relate to him and have him at least, you know, chuckle or open up and talk to you, that's huge. I mean, he didn't tell you no. He said, 
He's interested, uh, man. Yeah, that, that, I'll, that's I'll the talk biggest to BS line I've ever heard in my life. I'm not going to tell you if I'm interested or not, right. but you can call me back next Wednesday. If dude wasn't interested, you wouldn't be calling him back next exactly. Wednesday. So. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I, t- I took that as a win. I mean, totally. I felt I felt like I should have – I could have probably – if I was really on my game, I felt like I could have pushed harder in that moment and maybe got more out of him there because it, it was pretty early and in the conversation and – I don't know if he picks up the phone, we'll know. But um, I also n- knew that he, the way he approached it, I didn't get that blow off tone in his voice. It was, you know, it felt sincere. So we'll see. So what led you to call that guy to begin with? Like what kind of a list were you working off of? What were you trying to figure out? So I was using reference USA and um, just a, a, a contractor's list that I bought on Fiverr for like a hundred bucks. So I have basically every HVAC plumbing and landscaper. It's like 12,000 business name, phone number, emails. Some of them are complete garbage. Some of them are right on the, on the dot. Um, and I, so what I've been doing is I've been starting locally. So I know a lot of the names of the businesses in our area. So then I go, I check them out on reference USA. See, you know, then I, Google, you know, Google them or do Facebook real quick. And I kind of have all the tabs up on top of all the places that I want to search. So I'll have the, the Excel spreadsheet up, I'll, you know, kind of sort by city, Albany. Okay, cool. Here's the name. All right. Who's the guy? Boom, boom, boom. And, uh, that's how I've been, that's how I've been going through it. And then, um, like I said before, uh, the fact that I've dialed my technology down to just agency zoom, really it's agency zoom. And then I just use, you know, uh, QQ holds documents and, you know, policy numbers and stuff. So if I go through all that, they, I I feel like I have solid information and they fit what I'm trying to do in terms of being like a non-minimum premium contractor. You know, like the stuff I'm going after might be a little smaller than you guys right now, which is fine. Like I just wanted bats, but, um, doesn't matter, man. It's business. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hey, I got, I got, you know, I, I did I did this the other day and I picked up uh you know, I haven't signed her yet, but I got I'm I'm pitching I think I think our call is on Friday. I'm pitching a, like a five thousand dollar AOR on the on the package and a five thousand dollar workers comp policy that I'm gonna that I'm gonna rewrite. And um you know, that was off a cold call. Uh oh no, actually that was off the webinar idea that you gave me. She was off the webinar. I got another one that I'm working off a cold call, but she called me because she watched the webinar. You got so many leads, you can't keep track of them, man. <laughs> that's, not, that's not true. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about the four that I have. I'm just making it sound like it's a lot. Well, I'm interested. So like you went, you know, for all practical purposes, yeah, I know that you understand the research and things to do like that way, but you were pretty much flying blind calling this guy. He could have had a perfectly run company, no issues yeah. at all with his insurance. I mean, so some, and, and I mean, that speaks to the point, right? People, people get frustrated with telemarketing or calling to set appointments and they give up the average telemarketing campaign. If you get like 3% or 5%, yeah. 5%, you're a superstar, right? Yeah. Five out of a hundred and people, people quit with it. You know, and, and I've always looked at it. Everything I talk about, for the most part, is a baseball analogy. The absolute best hitters get out seven out of ten times. Yeah. You know, so why are we sitting here beating ourselves up over getting rejected that way? And honestly, for me, I don't beat the phones nearly like I used to. But back when I did, I would get once I got into my rhythm, my success rate started going higher and higher because I just didn't care. Yeah. Like I'd say whatever. It, it didn't matter. I would say something that had absolutely no relevance whatsoever just to see. And I was like, ah, just kidding. I wanted to see if you were paying attention to me. I was really calling to talk to you about something boring. I, but th- I, mean- I think there's two things there. I think one, um, I think the first part is a lot of agents don't actually believe the value proposition that they, um, that they, say that they're selling. I think they don't actually believe the value proposition. I think it's more about just getting business in the door. And I'm not I'll, saying- I'll go ahead and stop you right there and tell you that they don't have a value proposition. That's the problem. Well, dude, I think it's, this is what I think. I think it's worse than that. I think it, I'm, I'm actually saying, I think it's worse than that. 
I think it's not just that they don't necessarily understand what it is. Whatever they have in their mind as the is our value proposition, they don't actually believe it. It's how do I get someone to buy insurance from me? That is the, in my opinion, the absolute wrong way because what it does is it's price shopping. It's trying to just catch somebody randomly who who is having a bad day and actually uh, gives you a shot. It's not, how are you going to make this person's life better? Even if it is just simply saving them money, right? That sometimes that's what you're doing for them. Maybe they have good coverage, but you can just put them in something that's a little cheaper. You know, that happens in home and auto all the time. But I think... I think a big part of the cold calling, at least for me, uh, has been once I start to really believe my value proposition that I am coming in to help you, fuck, it gets so much easier. It gets so much easier because now I'm like, dude, if you don't want to do business with me, that's fine. But I know I'm helping you if you say yes. And, um, And that's a big part of it. I think that's a really big part. We just don't believe we don't believe what we're doing is actually helping people. We think we're just slinging policies. And uh, I think that makes it tougher. Well, I mean, that's one of the things Mike just talked about is people aren't passionate about what they do. If you're not going to be passionate about doing it, go find something else. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not a job. You know, this is like. It's, there are way it, easier ways to make money than this. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's the whole thing. You know, you have to enjoy what you're doing. You have to enjoy the fact that you're helping people and, you know, execute on that stuff. But you're right. I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it looks, I hope they don't change, man. Yeah. I really do because yeah, I've been, been really happy with my level of competition as of late, you know? Yeah. Oh, um, no. But it's, it's just, it's nuts because if you are, if you do, if you, if you can grind, you're going to win. Yeah. Like, seriously, you don't have to be the smartest person in, no. in this industry. You just have to be willing to work hard and, and do the same things and follow a proven path to success. That's it. I, I will never change. I mean, I adapt and modify here and there, but the core the core of what I do hasn't changed in almost 20 years. Yeah, I, I was talking to a marketing rep the other day and um, and – He's he was helping me get an appointment with a with a comp company up here in 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 New York, and um, we were, we were, I was like, you know, who who's killing it with you guys? Like like which which agency? Like who do I need to worry about? Like if I'm if I run up against who, and and they got a policy, you know, and they and they got your paper, and I see their name on it, like who should I be worried about? And he's like, he's like, uh, well, we have people that do volume but I'm not really sure if I could say any of them are like killing it. And I said, I said, I said, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, just like people tend to run into things. And I was like, run into things. Is that really what it's coming down to? Like you just run into things. And I get that like at a certain point, like you're, you're, if you have, if you do eat enough clients and you are slightly active in the community, you do bump into people and whatever, but like this, this woman down in Long Island, who who I'm writing this uh, works comp policy for, she, she, her agent in ten years, ten years had never told her that you could do monthly self reporting. That's awesome. Never told her. It's she's like, like literally you know, the it first would be thing really I said. nice if like she's like she she's HVAC contractor. She's like she's like you know our 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 every year our our payroll fluctuates. She's like some months are amazing and we our payroll is high. Other months are is, is amazing. Our payroll is lower. And she goes, man, it would be nice if there was a way for me to like pay more in the months when I pay a lot. And I was like, you know, I have this, there, there's this one, com- let me, let me see if I can figure something out for you. Hold on. Let me see. If I, can. I mean, never, I mean she, this is something she actively wanted, had asked the guy about, and he was just like, nah, nah, that's not a thing. He, that's what he said to her. That's not a thing. Now he's either so dumb he doesn't know, or he's just like she's never going to actually switch, so I don't have to tell her. Well, you know what's crazy, man? Even if your carriers don't offer it, you can use RP. Is it RPS, Kyle? RPM. It's a RPM reliable premium management. Or yeah. first, they're insurance? pretty big. They work with like basically any payroll company, um, and they, you know, essentially they're a third party that administers the pay as you go. They they get the information from the payroll company and they deduct it and, 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 and bill the, uh, the insured. It's pretty, 
it's pretty seamless and um there's just no, there's no reason for anybody especially that is in a skilled trade to not be on monthly self reporting do you know why we're not taking a hit? We have to worry about chargebacks right now in my agency because our people are on monthly self-reporting. Yeah, right. Or or weekly, like it, depending on the carrier with Amtrust, we can put them on weekly uh, yeah. payroll self-reporting. Yeah, and, and right. you know HVAC companies are notorious for that. If an HVAC company opens wrong, it will never be right because one talk, especially down here, and it's different up there, I'm sure, in terms of the the seasons. But once October hits, it's over. Like you are living thin until March of the following year. And the issue that we see them have down here is they'll start accruing debt, accruing debt, accruing debt. And then they have to have a record year in March, April, and May just to bail themselves out and get back to a level ground. And they don't have enough time to make forward progress going into the next fall. I've seen them run, you know, go bankrupt as a result. It's crazy. Yeah. So I'm, give them that one little thing, man. I mean, I, I've told you this is not a secret, right? Audit, always a pain point. Cash flow, always a pain point. You can cure both of those with one solution that most agents don't talk about. Yeah, I mean, this one, this was a layup for two for two reasons. One, she, she's she's begging for either monthly self reporting or pay as you go through a payroll company. She's like, I'll take either one. I'll, I just want this is what I want. So we're gonna figure out which one of those solutions works best. But whichever one it is is what we're gonna do. And the guy had her misclassified as a plumber for, um, for like forty percent of her payroll, and she's like, I don't. She, we do. She's like, we do zero plumbing. We do zero. He had her in uh, what is it, eighty eight fifty one or what, I have it over here someplace. It doesn't matter. He he had her in the wrong code, and she's like, it's been two years now. He just doesn't change it. And I'm 50, like, fifty one eighty three. Fifty one eighty three. Yeah, fifty one eighty three. And um, it's like making me now. It's gonna make me nuts that I don't. But um. You know, I, I, it's just like simple things like this, and and I guess I don't mean to be so hard on on other agents because I know there's probably nah, let them have it, bro. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, you know, I like to be, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt because I do think, like, you know, not not this guy. This guy's terrible. Whoever this person is, if he's listening, you're you're awful. Not, not you, I'm, you suck. And I'm taking your account from you on Friday. But um, <laughs> the the not that he really cares. It's not that much money, but. Um, you know, the idea is I've been in the biz, I've been in selling insurance. I've, I've been selling insurance for seven weeks. Right. And I, and I've learned just in those seven weeks so much that like, I'm, I'm rewriting accounts of people who this guy's been in business for 30 years. So when, when I run into agents out in the world, I have, I'm going to have far less empathy for them when they're like, I don't know what to do. You have to invest yourself. Like follow people who do things that you like the way they operate read a little you know what i mean don't just go to conference and get hammered and hang out in the hallway and pretend like you're making work phone calls like you know you know what i do during paid speaking gigs you know what i do i go into other sessions and i listen to people and learn while i'm there you know what i mean i'm not just i don't i don't understand why we make all these excuses there's so much knowledge and it just makes me crazy like i just don't get it well, look, and take it another step further, man. How much could they be learning right now? How much is at their fingertips? How many carriers are forcing webinars out almost on a daily basis? How many vendors are forcing webinars out on a daily basis? Everybody, if you don't come out of COVID smarter and with better product knowledge and skill set than what you went into it to, you completely blew it. Natural selection is going to take over and put you out of your misery. Yeah. Hey, here's the other thing, too. You can just call your carrier and ask them questions and learn a ton. You actually can learn some of the nuances of the paper that allow you to wedge, you know, if you really want to, if you really want to dive in, you know, I called, um, was it employers? I, I, I don't know. I just call these people. I just call them and I'm like, Hey, how would you handle this? How does this work? What, what, where are you killing it? What, what's going on up North? You know what I mean? Like, cause they're, I'm kind of right in the middle from a, what is it? Longitudinal standpoint, latitude. Which one goes down? Latitude. Well, longitude runs north to south, and latitude runs yes, east latitude. To west. I'm in the middle of the state from a latitude, so there's a whole bunch of territory north that tends to be a little more rural, but there's a lot of manufacturing and contractors up there. And then downstate is where all the crazy people live. And um, you know, I call them and I'm like, "Who's killing it up north? Like, what's going on up there? Like, are you doing?" 
You know what I mean? Like there's there's no natural disasters outside of snow. There's there's nothing that happens up there. So there's not a ton of losses. Like it's pretty stable business. And as long as you get into a good account, there's nothing. There's really good uh, profitability in the North Country because nothing happens. There's less people. You don't have as many car accidents. And like you could do that wherever you are. You can make those calls. Like I don't care what part of the country you're in. Call your under and go, where are you killing it right now? I'll go there and mark it. Uh, and just nobody does that stuff. Hey, look, man, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, you'll figure this out, but I'm going to get rid of the learning curve for you. Is you start putting business with underwriters and they know you're going to close stuff that they quote. The very next thing is, hey, tell me about the last three accounts you thought you were really hot on your pricing on that you didn't get. Because the producer from Brown and Brown shotgunned the market and just basically wasted your time. Then you start getting leads from underwriters. And there's nothing better than a lead from a pissed off underwriter who will do whatever they have to do to write that business yeah. as long as you can get in and bring it to them. I mean, I have written a ton of premium from one specific underwriter at one company that has just consistently over the course of my career said, I got shot down on this one. Go get it. I got shot down on this one. Go get it. Here's the file. Here's everything yeah. you need. I mean, obviously they're not supposed to do that, but people, guess what? Insurance deals don't get done the way you think they do, okay? You know, you have to have relationships with people on the streets. You have to be street smart and you have to know how to leverage those. And I can tell you right now, I've got a never-ending lead source because every single time I get handed one of those, if I can't get in, I at least explain why and try and figure it out for the next year. But if I get in, I close it. Every time. And that, all that does is breed more. And guess what that underwriter does? They talk to the one next to him. Hey, didn't you just have a, an account yeah. over, you know? People don't realize what a good lead source people on the inside of the carriers are, especially if they've been scorned. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I know, even at a very surface level that you can get out of them. What are you hitting on right now? Like yeah. that question, if you say that, like I, I, I called one of my other writers and this is why I'm going after the HVAC stuff besides just, you know, it being, it being a, a good market in New York. But like I said, what are you hitting on right now? And she was like, heating and cooling specifically, not plumbing, not electrical, not all artisan heating and cooling right now. We are just, we're just slightly we're just enough below the market that your pricing is going to be there and if you can do a couple good things for them and get in the door he's like you're going to get this you, you know we're we're right there so it's like they, they just gave you literally just handed to point a big arrow on the map like here you go now you got to figure out how to get in you got to talk to him and i said you know i'm working on you know making these connections and i'm cold i don't have a pipeline of people to go to but shit i got a direction i know i know which way to to point the guns, you know, and, and that's really step one. So, uh, you know, I just feel like these little things and, and, you know, and, and a lot of it has been being part of killing commercial has been tremendous for me, tremendous. And I don't mean it to be a commercial for you, although I'm, I'm assuming you don't mind, but, um, it has been, it has been tremendous to be around what I have enjoyed the most is, I mean, education is phenomenal and helped me with get my mind really wrapped around some topics, but just being around a group of people who, like uh, just the idea of like cold blooded killer, just like that idea of like you're out here to go do something, like to make make things happen. This isn't just like a a big sitting around in a circle, kumbaya. What's working for you? What's working? Um, it has been that mentality and energy has been intoxicating for me. Yeah, I mean it's interesting, man. The other thing too is the fact that you got a bunch of people in there that are not afraid to collaborate and they don't mind sharing what they know, you know. And I'll learn as much from people in there as I could ever teach them as far as that goes. And that's one of the whole reasons why, you know, to me, when I was thinking about how I was going to put the whole thing together, that was the secret sauce. You know, anybody can create a training program. I wanted a community and I want a community because there's a lot of power in numbers, right? There's nothing saying that at some point we have that thing fleshed out and we go to national carriers and say, we want a master contract with all of us as sub engines under the master contract. And by the way, our loss ratio for the average agency in this group is under 15%. So we'd like some better compensation and a little bit better profit sharing terms. And then you aggregate all of that premium instead of them going through the clusters that they're with now, which a lot of them are, yep. or some of them don't have the commercial carriers to begin with. Or you go to vendors and you say, I need preferred pricing for this. These are the tools we're going to use. Quit screwing around and haggling with us. 
this is the price we're willing to pay. We're going to send you a couple of people a month. They will automatically be closed because we believe in your products, but you got to give us some pricing consideration that, that takes into the fact that we're not wasting your time. You're literally closing 100% of the deals we're sending you. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, I think one of the things that, you know, one of the things that I think, like I look at IAOA as a group, and and I have so much respect for what they did, and and it's huge, and and not it's a completely different thing. But what I what I think that group has done for our industry in terms of just just their hashtag better together, like it really has um, opened up a lot of people to the idea that we can we can share ideas, and you're not just going to come take from me because I gave you those ideas. Um, I think the Elevate conferences help with that. And then I think, you know, uh, uh, IOA has helped with that. And then you've seen that propagate out through through the industry and other places. And it it really, it's special when you get these pockets of people who are so willing to share. You know, I, I was talking to, to um, oh, someone from the group the other day, uh, Ricky. I was talking to Ricky the other day. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're literally, I'm literally, he's telling me, exactly what he's doing verbatim and I'm telling him exactly what I'm doing verbatim and then we're talking about the things that aren't working and and you know I think the transparency and vulnerability that that's how you take it to the next level right because now it's not just like oh I wrote this account I wrote this account it's like oh shit man I had this good one teed up and I lost it here's why you know here's what I need to do different oh okay I had that same thing happen and um you know I, I think that's really where where you really start to take this to another level no, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I think you learn more from the ones that you lose than the ones that you win a lot of times. I mean, and just well, talking I, about that with somebody else. Listen, is, yeah, here's my theory on that. We don't ask about why we won. Right. I think, I think we need to ask more when we win. Tell me why I won. Because I think that there's times where, you know, for me, I'm seasoned enough at this point where I just inherently know I can't explain it, but it's just, it's practice, it's experience. I know when it's time to pivot. I know when I need to, like, if I see an opening that I didn't anticipate, I know when to go after that angle as opposed to where I thought the conversation was going to go. And it may be, an, it, it, it's so ingrained in what I do that I don't even know that I do it sometimes. And so when I win, if I ask somebody, look, I'm not trying to to beat a dead horse here. I really appreciate your business, but for my edification, we always talk about failing forward. I just won. Tell me why you made that decision. What was it that I said? What did I promise you? And it does two things. Number one, it gives me the ability to replicate that going forward because it's probably going to work with somebody else. And number two, it tells me what expectations I have to manage that I just set for myself that I may not be aware that I set. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, so I mean, Kyle, talk a little bit about marketing drops so that Hanley can let uh, let his mouth water a little bit. You know, he uh, well, he's re he's ready I to get out. I bought these folders to learn from your marketing drops, and then you didn't tell me COVID was coming. You could have said, "Hey, man, <laughs> hold off on the five hundred folders because COVID is coming." Hey, listen, you know what? I'm in the same boat, man. I've got 82 boxes of Girl Scout cookies across the <laughs> hall from my office, and it started out as a hundred. <laughs> there's, there's 18 uh, missing boxes of girl scout cookies you're gonna wear that uh, orange theory treadmill out when this oh my god man i need it it's gonna to be a nightmare no i feel like a slob man i feel terrible i was sitting there yesterday telling one of my buddies i'm like dude i i've got to do something tomorrow as i just feel worthless <laughs> like, yeah just sitting around but um no, I mean, on the drops, I mean, I think it's it's similar to when you're making phone calls. You've got to do the research on the front end in order to have a successful drop. Like, you know, the ones that you go in and do just completely blind, you're not going to get the same results. I mean, you might get lucky once or twice. Of course, that happens. But, you know, you, you need to do the research on the front end to figure out not only who you need to talk to, but what things you may have in common, you know, what they have in place currently and where you can kind of drive a wedge. And I, I think that... Uh, the thing that's most important when you're going in and doing a drop with somebody 
is first of all, just being able to relate with that first gatekeeper, getting them to like you or smile. You got to ice break, even if it's the cheesier, the better, whatever you just got to do it because otherwise they're just going to call you on your shit and, and say, okay, what are you selling, man? And then you're already starting off behind the eight ball because you're not there selling something. You're, you're, you're there. You want to talk to them about a solution for their business. And even though they may not be the person that <clears throat> you need to have that discussion with, they're going to be the person that gets you in front of that person that you need to have that discussion with. So if you don't win them over, you're, you're not going to, um, you're not even going to get to the decision maker. So I think that, I think that part is absolutely crucial and it's something that people don't, all people discount it. I think. Um, and, Are you and doing research on the gatekeeper? I mean, it, if, if you know who it is, right? It's not always possible. Um, I'm more so doing research on the business and who I think is going to be the decision maker, just so that I can have, I can, you know, maybe reference an article that I read. Hey, I noticed you guys just got awarded, you know, best top, you know, hundred businesses in Tampa Bay to work for. That's pretty awesome. You know, you guys must have a great culture here. And what that, that's enough of an icebreaker for me to, to, you know, to start talking to them and figure out who I actually need to get in front of if it's the, you know, if it's the person that I, you know, um, anticipated or not. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it it's tough to kind of do the research on, on a gatekeeper, so most of the time you don't really know who that is. No, but you know? you're doing it after you leave, right? So my whole well, thing absolutely. is if I'm, in, so, if I'm in there talking to them, I'm listening to everything that's coming out of their mouth. I'm looking at everything that's sitting on their desk. And then I'll turn into Johnny Cyberstalker the second I get back so that I know. First place I go is LinkedIn pretty much yeah. and or Facebook. I mean, I, I want, I'm going to, and, and y- you know, the other thing too is, is, I mean, that's part of the research on the front end is I'm, I'm, I'm going to LinkedIn and Facebook a hundred percent of the times when I'm looking up businesses, because most of the time it's got laid out, you know, their employees that are on there. And if they have any type of social media presence, their people are going to have, you know, profiles. So you can, you can kind of get some, a little bit of Intel on, on gatekeepers from that. If they, if they do have, um, you know, if, the, if they are on there, but you know, anyways, if, 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 if not, I'm a hundred percent, like David said, doing that, on the back end, when I get back from doing drops, I'm it, it, continuing that research because you're not you're not going to get in front of them the first time every time. You might have to go back two, three, four times. You might have to call them and shoot some emails and do a bunch of different touches in order to, you know, finally um, get their attention. So I, th- I think that's that's crucial. I think the other part of it is we're going in with the expectation that we're not going to get through. Like we, we don't, that's not even what the goal is really. The goal is just to make sure right. we're validating who the decision maker is and getting their contact information. And if so you're not, if you're not pushy about trying to get in front of that person, you actually get further with the gatekeeper. And the other thing is, and I think where a lot of people fall off the wagon when you're doing cold call marketing drops is it's the first meeting. It's the, I mean, it's literally your first attempt at physically and personally reaching out to this company. You're, you're not going to hit it and quit it. You've got right. to go back a second time or a third time or whatever it's going to take. And I mean, that's what blows my mind is how many people want to do a drop. They don't write the business, obviously, the first time. And all of a sudden, it's a waste to go back to that person again instead of doing everything they can to make themselves familiar to them. We were in one for a plumbing con, like a, a plumbing supply company. And, and when we went in, it was it was hilarious because like – it couldn't have gone any better, right? And I was with a producer at the time that was struggling, not making their numbers and made every excuse in the book as to why they weren't making their numbers. And I'm thinking, wow, I would, I could close this account on the next visit based on how this went. We walk in. I mean, this was like the absolute worst setup for a cold call marketing drop. Literally, they had the gate pulled almost all the way shut. Like, it was diff. I had to turn sideways to walk in, and even then had to suck it in to to get in between the gate to to get in. And the lady's just sitting there with stink eye all over the place, you know. When I walk up to her, and like anybody would have just said, you know what, screw it, this isn't worth it. I'm not going to take the abuse. We walk in, introduce ourselves. She immediately turns over to the guy that's delivering the rugs and says something to him, and then she goes to the girl that was sitting there and says, "Hey, don't we want the ones with the pads on them?" And the girl says, yeah, my dad really prefers those. So I'm like, ding, ding, ding. Now we have the owner's daughter sitting at the computer right here. What's this lady's story? You know, and so the, it, and it's hilarious because the, the rug guy is like, 
well, it's going to cost you an extra dollar a month for you to have those. It's twelve dollars a year, and you know, based on the way your contract's worded, uh, I'm going to have to get an exception for that. And I'll talk to management and get back to you. And he turns around and walks away, and the lady goes, um, "She, she, she said, I'm sorry. I, you know, I needed to deal with that quick. I said, No, actually, I owe you an apology. And she looked at me. I said. I apologize. You had to witness that horrible sales behavior. That's absolutely nuts. This Crazy. guy can't make a $12 decision on the fly. I mean, for 12 bucks, I, I felt bad for him. I just want to take it out of my pocket and give it to him. And she starts, <laughs> nuts. She, I said, your account's got to be worth more than 12 bucks a year to this clown. And so we're like yeah. laughing back and forth. And somehow Girl Scout cookies came up and she said, oh, I want to try the new lemon Girl Scout cookies. And we talked about Girl Scout yeah. cookies for a while. Overrated. And then, then the other girl's like, well, you know, if you're going to be talking about food, you better bring Chick-fil-A up in here. And I was like, okay, what's what's that Chick-fil-A order look like? She goes, I'm a number one with a large sweet tea. I was like, I had you pegged from the second I saw you. You know, there's no doubt in my mind. And we're just like BSing the whole time. We're sitting there talking and these people are laughing. They're engaged. We hadn't even mentioned what we're there for yet. And mm -hmm. then we start talking about the insurance piece. And she said, well, the owner, you know, the owner's really tough to get to know. He's slow to move, but you guys have a good personality. I think it would be good if you were to come back in. But I will tell you, we're having some problem with our employee benefits. Do you know any? I said, oh, yeah, let me guess. You're, you've got issues with your benefits because um, you're on a level funded plan and he doesn't like the way they're handling the withdrawals and all this other stuff. And boom, like she was like, that's exactly what it is. And so we get out to the car and, and I talked to the producer. I'm like, so what's the follow up from this? And he said, well, I'll, you know, I'll go back and I'll shoot him an email template and I'll, I'll probably follow up by phone. I'm like, that's not the follow up. The follow up is one week from today, you show up with two boxes of lemon Girl Scout cookies, a number one with Chick -fil from Chick-fil-A with a large sweet tea, and that's it. You take mm -hmm. it to them and you say, look, let's talk about benefits. We can help you with that. But, you know, let's set up a time where you're expecting me. I didn't want to, you know, bombard you. I did want to bring this over because I thought we had a great conversation last time. I said that cost you what? 20 bucks or less to do that, there's a guarantee you will write that account. 100%. There's no doubt in my mind that that account gets written. But the answer was, well, I'm going to rely on be doing the laziest thing I possibly can to follow up on it. So I, I think you made a good point there where we're going in and we're not, it's not like we're trying to close the deal right then. I, you know, m my past when, with selling the office supplies, I had to go in and sell them stuff right then and there. Like, I mean, sure, I could come back, you know, later on in the week. And, you know, sometimes I had to just because I couldn't get in front of that person at that particular time. But like, it, it is such a different feel and you go in much more, um, you know, relaxed and able to have an easy conversation when you know that I'm not looking to go and, and close this deal today. I'm not even necessarily looking to get in front of the decision maker today because, realistically they're the decision maker for a reason they're probably busy doing stuff like they're, they're not, busy you know, making decisions <laughs> yeah like i mean you know so if if i'm going in which hey i just need to get the information make a decent impression try to build a little bit of rapport with the gatekeeper makes it so much easier so that when you do follow up when you've got you know some some information and some um, you know, ways to, to go back and approach it next time. It, it, it's, it's that much easier and, and you're, you know, having a more personal conversation with them versus this is some dude just trying to come in here and sell me insurance. Well, I mean, listen, what's Wayne Gretzky say? You miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Like that's what cracked me up. I, I, I would listen to, I went back and forth or not back and forth, but I was in a thread in one of the groups the other day. And, and this guy like laid out this outlandish case about he was invited to participate in meeting with this company, but they had four other brokers that were going to go after it or whatever else. And, you know, he wasn't sure how he should handle it. All the other agents are out there saying, kill it. Don't go to the meeting. Don't waste your time. Don't do this and don't do that. And I was completely opposite. I said, take the meeting. Don't ever not take a first meeting. This is your chance to educate that person on why they should maybe consider doing business a different way. I can't tell you. I mean, listen, man, literally 100% of the people that we, there's never a time, never a time that I go in to a first appointment and the person starts off the conversation saying, I'd really like for you to talk to me about how I can reduce my total cost of risk <laughs> and get better containment on the soft they, cost of they work. They do, account. something like, is wrong. I'd leave. <laughs> right. I think that never yeah. happens. Yeah. 
Somebody's somebody's punk. Where's Ashton Kutcher? Somebody's punking me right now. Well, yeah, every it, every conversation you have has to be. It has to be you teaching that person what it is that you do, how you do it, why you do it, how it's going to be beneficial to them, and why they should hire you instead of who they already have. And everybody, if you if they give you an open mind and the ability to listen to what you have to say, specifically me, like the way that I go in and lay the value proposition out, they should buy literally every single time. If they don't, at that point, if I haven't been able to articulate why making do why doing business with me makes sense and that my message is so completely different than everybody else's, then it probably is not going to be a good fit to begin with. And I can deal with it at that point. I'll go back, I'll lick my wounds, I'll see what could I have said differently. Sometimes there's not anything at all that you could say because they just buy on price and that's all they're ever going to do. But you can't just give up without the first meeting. It's just that's the worst advice I've ever heard. So there is, <clears throat> my opinion is, so I've never been a purist in anything, um, whether it was sports, music, you know, whatever. I just, I don't, I've never been perfect at anything. So it's hard for me to live like this purist life of like, I don't quote, I don't, you know, da, 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 da. And like, um, actually, if you want to see the worst content that I've created for Rogue, go look at the first video I did where I talk about proposals instead of quotes. It's so put on and like, like this, it's just terrible. Like I'm going to take it down and redo it as soon as I have the time. I just don't care, I guess right now. But um, there is this level of purism where people are like, oh, I don't bid. And that, that's just masturbation and procrastination. That's all that is. That perfectionist, purist nonsense it's like, I see it all the time. All these people get in these battles on IOA, which I don't involve myself in. Sometimes I voyeur them because they're just so ludicrous. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like watching, uh, it's like watching a, like a car crash happen. But uh, to me, that's just, that, that is go do the friggin' work. I guess I, I guess, I don't know if it's cause I was raised in the woods by working class kind of people or, or what it was, but like, I, I just, this whole idea that like you're, Sorry, I'm not going to come in because you're talking to two other brokers. I, sorry. No, nope, I'm going to put my hands up and you're going to have respect for me because I didn't do. Fuck that. Like, go in there, sell yourself, talk about what you do, and they're either going to like you or they're not going to like you. But the issue is that's not easy, right? Because you know you have two other people in there. And, you know, I think I think that's what a lot of it is. And, and um. You know, it comes back to what I was saying before. Like, I've gotten so many messages from so many people since I started this agency, and I love it. And I help everyone that I can and try to let them know some of the shit that I figured out. And, you know, it's not like this is my first go around either. But, um, you know, I, I just think this is you like, you have to enjoy selling yourself. That's what you're selling because the products are the products. There's a million of them. There's all these different companies. They all do different things. Once you think you have one figured out, they change. Once you have a great underwriter, that underwriter leaves and goes to another company. It, it's, it's crazy and dynamic. And the only thing that's constant is you and your ability to provide a service to a customer. And even that's going to change. But like this, I, I just, other than that, like if, if you're unable to sell yourself, well, then that's a problem you have to fix. But, you know, your carriers, your markets, you can always get at them. You got to, you know what I mean? You don't have a carrier? Go get a big ass fish on the line and tell them that you need an appointment to, 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 put, this, to put this policy on the books. I have a pretty good feeling they're going to give you an appointment, right? The reason they said no to you the first time is because you didn't have anything for them. So, you know, I, I just think that it's, it's about... I, all I, I've just come to realize in, in my time, whatever, seven weeks so far and all the time I had before is that this is a grinder's game. It's why I create content. It's why I did the things that I did before. It's all that I know is you just work. And some of it is terrible. Some of the videos I've done are terrible. They're terrible. Half the shit I say in there is not even, it's nonsensical. I say it twice. It's filled with ums and ahs. Most, it's not even true. It's barely true. We'll put it barely true. You know what I mean? Like, 
Fuck. Sounds awesome. Put it out. Create another one. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the whole thing, man. It goes back to what you said originally, right? People don't believe in the value proposition they're selling. And my my point to that is they don't have a value proposition. You're talking about people who sell insurance, not people who solve problems. Yeah. And that's that's the difference between looking at total cost of risk, selling value, delivering value, and placing coverage. They're two completely different things. Yeah. And that's why I never even talk about placing coverage. That's the that's the assumed part of the transaction. Yeah. Placing insurance is the funding mechanism that you're going to have to give me the control over so that you can have all of this other stuff we agreed your company desperately needs right now. Yeah. And if you want this, then I have to do that. If you want this and you don't want to do that, I, I suppose I can sell this to you on a fee for service basis, but why wouldn't you want to use money you're already spending? I mean, you've got somebody that's not delivering good results. Why is this a difficult decision? Here's the other and I mean, thing. I mean, that's the whole thing. Because I think a lot of people listen to your content and they say to themselves, well, he writes big accounts and I don't write big accounts like him. So that that's not my world. And I think that that's wholly untrue. I think the principles apply 100%. It doesn't matter if you're selling a $600 rental property policy or a $600,000 apartment comp, you know, mega complex. It doesn't matter. Like the principles that work that you're talking about that, you know, that I've learned from you and others and, and just so many people in our industry that, that do think this way is, you know, it's go in there and solve a problem that they have. Sometimes, yes, that problem is as shallow as price, but many times it's far deeper it has to do with communication and trust and respect. It has to do with properly setting up policies. It has to do with understanding the difference between, you know, I, I had someone, call, well, I don't even want to get into that. But um, the idea is like, if you have to have a tough conversation with someone to properly serve them, have the tough conversation. They can always choose what you don't think is the right decision. That's their prerogative. But I, well, what it bothers me and has always bothered me, this was even 15 years ago when I first started selling, is when people will not have a tough conversation because they're worried that's going to jeopardize their sale, right? D have the tough conversation. Let them decide to self-insure if that's what they want to do. That's that's a perfectly acceptable decision in most places, you know, outside of like auto insurance or whatever in, in states where it's mandatory. But like, and I just, you know, why don't people sell more cyber insurance? because they don't want to talk about it. It's a knockdown, easy sale. It's a no-brainer coverage today. If anything, it's more important than general liability right now. In our society, right this moment, cyber liability could be, is most likely more important. Maybe professional lines is more important. Maybe a professional policy is more important because everyone's doing business this way. There's no general, there's no slip, trip, and fall risk. Like, what are we, but no one will talk about it. No one talks about it. No, you know what I mean? It just, it just, it's like this thing out here and no one wants to have that conversation. Maybe they throw a endorsement on that has some crappy amount of sub sublimit. Um, but you know, these are the conversations I think that separate those of us who are going to win long term and, and those who won't. Um, it requires education and product knowledge and understanding to talk about cyber. That's the barrier, right? You actually have to lift a finger and do something. Nobody's going to and every policy is different. Every coverage form is different. You have to know the difference between what they have or what they've been quoted and what they don't have and, and all of that other stuff. And I mean, that's what's crazy is it's, it's low hanging fruit, man. I can see it plain as day. Yep. I know because I can tell you what my Google AdWords says I've spent in advertising and the number of click throughs that I've gotten and the cyber policies we've written on a completely transactional sale during COVID because I set that funnel up. But you know, it's, it's, it, I don't know, man, it's, it, I hope, I hope the industry changes for the better to a certain degree, but another side of me says, eh, go ahead. I enjoy, I enjoy the way that it is right now because it makes it so much easier. I'm going to say two things as we close out here. Uh, first is uh, Chris Buran was on Cass's podcast uh, twice and he said um, something on the most recent one that really I think everyone should hold in their mind. Uh, he went back and researched uh, the last, I think it was either five or seven cata major national catastrophes. And then the policy purchasing um, uh, shit, like their their habits, what, what happened in policy purchasing post those catastrophes. 
we have a 24 month window where people real are really listening to coverage and they're listening to, 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 to taking care of their businesses and their families. They're going to buy personal umbrellas. They're going to buy extra professional policies. You know, they're going to take care of their, they're going to start to take care of their business for 24 months and they're going to shut it down again and go back to price shopping. And you can either take, you can either look at that as, oh shit, like I'm going to get my lunch eaten. Or you can use that knowing that people's ears are open to you and go out and win. I, I just, that to me was like, it was like douse and rocket fuel. Cause it was like, I'll nerd out as well as anybody. And I'm not at other people's level yet, but I'm going to do that work. Cause that's a place where we can win. Um, now nah, I can't even remember what the other thing was. Well, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would tell you this, man, you have come a long way in the couple of months since the end of January sitting at that table. I mean, you have a lot to be proud of, uh, you know, of anybody out there. I don't think that anyone has worked any harder or any smarter for that matter, because you can't distribute content at the level you distribute it without knowing how to do that too. You could work really hard and get two blogs out a day, or you could work smart and work hard and get 12 out in a day, you know? And I think that anybody who wants to build a content driven marketing strategy, or at least have that as one of the tools they're using would be remiss if they didn't just watch, just watch what you're doing. I mean, it's that simple. And it's the perfect time for you to be doing it. And guess what? Not very many other people are. So that's number one. Number two, your head's got to be ready to explode, man. I mean, you've been drinking out of a fire hose. You've been learning some high level stuff that you were not expecting to walk into. And I'm not saying that to beat my chest. I'm talking in general, like the people that you're talking with that are giving you advice and sort of counseling you and coaching you along the way. You're, I can tell you just from the conversations we have, the content of the conversation has shifted dramatically from where it was. In January, you were looking for what toys you were going to buy. Now you realize that toys aren't important. And what you really need to do is focus on processes and executing those processes and you're golden. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it means a lot. Um, you know, I'll say uh, you know, you always say like, you're like, I'm not the smartest guy or whatever. Like, I, you know, I, I, I barely made it out of high school and I cheated my way through college. Like I am also not the smartest guy. Um, but I do know that, uh, my superpower is like the matrix. Like I can download some motherfucking knowledge and, and it doesn't end. Like I can just like, I just love soaking this stuff up. Like I just love it. And like, you know, when, when, you know, sitting at that table, going back to how we started our conversation, you know, you and Mike and some of the other guys, like, like it was overwhelming, but it was also like, it was like, it was exactly what I needed in that moment. Right. I'm just hearing all these conversations. I'm taking them all the way in and it was setting a foundation for like, I may not come back to this topic for three months, but I'm here's, I need to come back to this thing. Like this is, you know, bam, I got that. I'm sucking this in. And I think it's just about exposing ourselves to, to, in a, in the, in the legal way, not in the, you know, we, no one needs to see anyone's junk, but, um, you know, I think exposing yourself to just these high level conversations, you don't have to understand it, but, but cause you can come back to it later. And I think we avoid some of these cause we feel inadequate about them. And, um, you know, just, just never, I guess my, my advice to people is just don't stop asking questions. Like I just, I just have no problem asking people's questions. How do you do that? Here's what the worst that person can say is, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's the worst. That's the worst yeah. they can say. They, you know, what they're most likely to say is, hey man, when I have some time, if you can make yourself available, I'll show you exactly what I do. And that's what happens 90% of the time. More often than not, my day starts at between 5.30 and 6 when I look at my phone and I've already got an instant message from Ryan Hanley. So, <laughs> 4.30 every day. 4.30. Yeah, I'm, I'm not far behind you, man. It's been getting earlier and earlier. Well, listen, bro, I yeah. appreciate you coming on and rapping with us for an hour. I'm proud of everything that you've done. It's good to see you executing. I know that you want to see the tangible results and all i can tell you is keep the faith man it's gonna yeah. the money will always follow the passion 
And as long as you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be wildly successful and you have an army of people behind you that are going to help that to happen. So keep it up, well, keep up the good work and keep on grinding. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Kyle, I, I appreciate you. And, and, uh, I, I took a page full of notes while you were talking, bro. So don't think I wasn't listening. And, um, and I look forward to when we can finally meet and, uh, yep. and, and, and David, man, like I just, thanks for continuing to answer all my ridiculous Facebook messages. These ideas that I have at 10 30 PM on a Saturday when I'm drunk as a skunk, I'll be t Facebook messaging you and, and you'll be the next morning. I'll get answers to all of them. And, uh, I appreciate it, man. It's really, it's helped me move me along. So thank you. Absolutely. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>